Kirby in the Forgotten Land was kind of a banger, and it really put me in the mood to play more Kirby, so hey, why not? I'm trying to make these videos feel a little more spontaneous, less planned ahead of time, so while I'm in the mood for it, let's look at the next game in the series. Kirby Air and the Amazing Mirror. I've barely played this one. Now, when I had barely played the Dreamland games, it was hard to really put my finger on why they didn't click with me. But Amazing Mirror? I knew exactly why I barely played Amazing Mirror. It's confusing. No, actually confusing and hard to navigate in a Kirby game. Yeah, Amazing Mirror is essentially a Kirby Metroidvania, the Great Cape Offensive taken to the absolute extreme. That sounds amazing, but in practice, they messed up the most important part of a Metroidvania, the map. It doesn't make any sense, at least from what I remember. Because in all honesty, I've never really tried to play it again after I got in the 3DS Ambassador program. You know, free GBA games, because I bought a 3DS before it was cool. I already talked about this in my Metroid Fusion review. I was really stoked to play it back in the day. I always saw commercials for it as a kid and was sad I missed out on it. That was the second game from this thing that I tried out after Menish Cap, which made it all the more depressing that I wasn't into it. Thinking about it, maybe they should have given us Nightmare and Dreamland instead. Probably would have sold more people on Kirby aside from how amazing Triple Deluxe and Robobot turned out. But I'm getting way ahead of my so let's hope that I don't hate Kirby in the Amazing Mirror this time. There's some magic mirror thing wreaking chaos on Dreamland, and Meta Knight tries to stop it, fails, and then some mirrored Meta Knight dude splits Kirby into four. Mirror Meta Knight also splits the entrance to the Mirror World into eight, and Kirby has to put it back together again. That's pretty much it. There's also a Mirror Kirby, but all he does is throw a single attack at you whenever you meet him. It's easy to forget that he exists. Not much of a story as usual, but Amazing Mirror is easily the most unique in the gameplay department. Like I said 30 seconds ago, this is essentially a Metroidvania light. It's a non-linear romp full of interconnecting rooms and paths. And I said that it reminded me of the Great Cave Offensive, but after playing it, Amazing Mirror is his own beast entirely. He was still running around opening treasure chests, but GCO was still pretty linear for the most part. There was some openness to it, but Amazing Mirror takes that to a whole nother level. In fact, this is insane just how non-linear it is. Your goal is to get all eight mirror shards. There's one in each area aside from the first, which acts more like an overworld, and you can get them in any order. And it has four player co-op where each player independently wanders around until they run into another player. On Game Boy Advance! How the hell do these people pull that off? Like seriously, you ever thought as a kid you could plug in the link cable and run around in the same world as your friends and Pokemon or something? This is a game where you could actually do that. And it does co-op in a really awesome way. You can divvy up the work and finish the game super fast or just dick around with your friends and help each other out when needed. Like, good lord, this is an ambitious ass game. Amazing Mirror was actually one of two main games developed by Flagship instead of HAL, with the other being Squeak Squad. I really couldn't find much about these guys. They were owned by Capcom, and I think they mostly did ports aside from the Zelda Oracle games and Minish Cap. Amazing Mirror does reuse a lot from Nightmare and Dreamland, but they didn't take the easy route. They were tasked in making a Kirby game, and they really went the extra mile in doing something weird and cool. Although it's not perfect in execution. You know, given that it was on Game Boy Advance, there was bound to be some technical hiccups. I've only played the game solo, but given the nature of needing so many link cables and four GBAs and everything, it's kind of a pain to set up. You can do co-op with only two or three players, but still, it's a pain. And if anyone pauses the game to open the map, it pauses for everyone, along with everyone needing to be on the same map page. On top of that, I think the game can get pretty laggy at points in multiplayer, but for the technology they had to work with, they probably pulled it off the best they could. Most of that it doesn't really matter if you're playing by yourself, though. I could tell the GBA was struggling every now and then, but that was about it. And it might have just been an emulator thing, although MGBA is pretty damn good nowadays. The game is on Wii U Virtual Console, but honestly, I didn't feel the need to buy a version of the game that you can't really buy in a few months when I already have it on 3DS. Back on point though, the game really isn't as confusing as I thought it was. Why did I think this was confusing? Because I was 13, that's why. This was right before I got into Metroid, so I wasn't used to a structure like this and dropped it pretty quick. Granted, this map isn't the most straightforward thing around. This isn't like Metroid, but with all big areas connected by doors or elevators, it's more like separated linear rooms that you go through in a non-linear order. That sounds confusing, but if you've played it, you probably know what I mean. While the map is pretty Metroidvania, -y, it's not a full-on one because you don't really get new abilities. You'll get maps and a health upgrade on occasion, but that's it. You don't have to unlock flight or anything. But ultimately, each area goes like this. You end up there through one way or another, you wander around until you can find the map, and from there, you make a beeline toward the boss, usually finding some warp points back to the main hub along the way. Easier said than done at first, but once you learn how to use the map, it actually conveys information in subtle ways. Straight lines are two-way doors, arrowed lines are one-way, but they're usually only before a boss. Big rooms are bosses, warp points, or contain a 
big chests, and the stores above doors glow when you haven't entered them before. And just to keep your sanity, each room blinks on the map screen if you found every chest in it. So yeah, it sounds like a lot, and it's a bit more complicated than usual for Kirby, but everything clicks once you get used to it. And if you get too lost, you can just hold L to warp back to the hub. Or will also let you call over your friends to your location for help, but I honestly forgot about it. You only need to use it like once or twice, and even then it's just to get an optional chest. Batteries will recharge your phone, but again, I didn't use it much. Not even from the final boss. Otherwise, the other Kirby just wander around doing whatever, taking turns on the same brain cell that runs Netflix. Their goals are beyond our understanding. Aside from the unusual structure, there isn't much new to the game. It's already pretty familiar if you've played Nightmare in Dreamland, and the level design in general isn't anything to write home about. Nothing in particular really sticks out to me or anything. This giant cannon maze was pretty neat, but that's about it. Still, I get why the level design is like this. When the game's so non-linear, you have to take a step back and make the level design more straightforward and flexible to accommodate that. The area themes are pretty basic too. Plains, a mountain, a castle, you know, pretty standard stuff. The ruins was the only annoying one, mainly because it took me an embarrassingly long time to figure out that you have to kill this fake door to reveal an actual door in order to progress. It's kind of dumb, but I don't know how it took me so long to figure it out. The puzzles are pretty alright too. There's an occasionally neat one to get a chest, but that's about it. Aside from the big chest, they don't usually give anything other than food items or batteries, but sometimes you'll get music tracks to listen to, which is fine I guess, but the cooler collectible is spray paints. Yeah, you can change Kirby's color in this game, that's really cool. But what's bizarre about it is that it doesn't save when you change it and it can only be changed in the main menu. So you'll probably change it, forget about it, turn the game off, and then realize 10 minutes into the next session that you're not the same color you were last time. And it also doesn't affect the color of the other Kirby's. Like I swapped to red at one point because it's objectively the best color, so now there's just two red Kirby's running around. It's not a big deal, but it's weird. Changing color is a cool feature though, I have no idea why they never brought it back aside from Squeak Squad. Kirby's color doesn't change when he has certain abilities after this, which always felt weird to me. Either change the color occasionally or let us change it. It was a great touch in Superstar. And it's probably a lot easier to recolor a few textures in a 3D model than it is to recolor a bunch of sprites. Speaking of Superstar, some copy abilities have multiple attacks again, but only a few, mainly Sword, Hammer, Fighter, and Smash from what I can remember. I get that this was built from a game without multiple attacks, but I feel like they could have done a little more with it, mainly with Fire and Burning, which are separate abilities again. That's just dumb. At least you can jump with a wheel. There are a few new abilities, but they're pretty bad. <laughs> missile turns you into a missile, which is not as cool as it sounds. It's actually pretty hard to use. There's Cupid, which is useless. It shoots arrows that don't do much damage, and you can fly without having to hold the jump on. Neat, I guess. And then there's Magic, also useless. It's one use only, with a random effect that's only given by a single mini boss fun. Mini is at least an interesting idea. It makes Kirby smaller to fit in tight passageways. But in practice, that's all it is. You use it to get a few chests and you can't take it out of the room you got it in. You can't even attack while using it. Mini is a puzzle solution and nothing else. But the crappy abilities are completely made up for by... That wasn't even a joke, this is literally just Kirby's Smash moveset. It is four abilities in one, and it does a ton of damage since it gets access to the hammer and stone attacks. Your Nair has some great range too, and the only way to get this is from a single mini boss. Master Hand. This is amazing. Like, I don't even care about how lackluster the other new abilities are. Smash is one of the coolest in the series. They also brought back a few old ones that were Nightmare and Dreamland, like Fighter and Bomb, so I can't complain too much. It's a really missed opportunity to not bring back Mirror, though. Like, it's literally in the title. Come on. Oh yeah, mirrors. Once you actually get all the mirror shards, you repair the big fancy mirror in the hub and it's final boss time. The Meta Knight you fought before is actually the creatively named Dark Meta Knight and you kick his ass. But what's really annoying about this fight is that if you die, you respawn at the beginning of the fight with no ability. So you're kinda screwed. I really don't know why you don't respawn in the hub. That would've made things a lot less annoying. And because you unlock the ability room when you find every warp point, you could just go back and get whatever you want. It would've been really convenient. But nah. The fight isn't really too noteworthy otherwise, it just has this bizarre oversight. After kicking Dark Meta Knight's ass, I think it was just an illusion for the real enemy. Dark Mind. But to fight him, the actual Meta Knight lends Kirby his sword. The Gala- Ma Master? What? Is isn't it called the Galaxia? D did it even have an actual name back then? I don't know. The point is, the big endgame ability this time is a souped up version of sword that does a bunch of damage. It's like the Dreamland 2 Rainbow Sword. 
but good. And it's really cool that he gets to use Meta Knight's sword for once. The kid in me that was convinced he could take it in Nightmare in Dreamland is extremely satisfied with this information. The first phase of Dark Mind weirdly has you fighting him multiple times through different rooms. It kind of feels like padding, to be honest. One decently long fight would have felt better than multiple shoulder fights with barely anything changed. But for a few phases of the same fight, the Eldritch Horror final boss of the week finally shows up. This time, an extremely menacing giant eyeball. This fight's actually pretty difficult, I was kind of surprised. A lot of his attacks are just hard to dodge is all. I just need to learn the pattern and know what attacks to use. This upstabbing attack does wonders. After a few tries, Dark Mind wasn't so bad. Alternatively, you can just call your friends and the fight is really easy. I think this was intended to be a group pummeling fest, actually. But Dark Mind isn't done exploding yet, so he chased him down in this top-down shooting thing real quick. On the one hand, this is kind of cool, but on the other hand, why is this fight still going? It's pretty easy, but like... Come on, just die already. And for some reason, the credits are just you wailing on him some more. I actually feel bad for this dude, at least let him die with dignity. Dark Mine is an oddly overkill final boss. This dude's almost got enough phases to make Nyx shudder. The ending is pretty standard, though. The Mirror Ward is a piece, but don't worry about everything breaking again, Mirror Kirby can protect it. Yeah, did you forget about him? I guess he's on your side, but the only useful thing he does is chuck the Galaxia back at you if you doubt a Dark Mine. This bitch doesn't even help you fight it. Good for him for stepping up and being useful, but I'm actually kind of worried about this place now, not gonna lie. What's pretty cool is that afterwards, you get Master to use anywhere you want. It's really helpful to finish up the completion percentage, since it works for most puzzles. Speaking of, going that extra mile is pretty boring. Running around this place, filling up every corner of the map, getting every chest, it's not very fun. Having Master helps, but it could be better, and it definitely highlights how useless a lot of optional stuff is. Like, there's paths that lead to dead ends with exits back to the main hub. Why? I can just hold down L to do that. I guess it'll give you more lives and health, but it's just a massive pace breaker to get back to where it was before. And every now and then there's a shortcut to get from one area to another, but you need to open it from both sides. So why would I bother doing that when the hub covers most of it anyway and is a lot more convenient? It's a nice idea, but it shows how much of these collectibles feel like busy work. Why go through so much effort to get a chest when it just ends up being useless food half the time? I did miss some health upgrades and colors, but honestly, I felt like I spent an extra two and a half hours doing nothing. 100%ing the game isn't enjoyable like it usually is for me. All you get from it is a boss rush. That's it. Aside from sub-games that are unlocked from the start and aren't that great, there's Speed Eaters that's pretty much Quick Draw, but with multiplayer. Speed Eaters also has the same issue as Quick Draw, where you need inhuman reaction times in order to win the higher difficulties. Like, I swear, the AI cheats and presses A on the first frame that they can. Crackety Hack has Megaton Punch. But with multiplayer, the AI also cheats and you have to be pretty close to perfect to win on higher difficulties. You can probably see where the last one's going, but you'd actually be wrong. The last one is Wave Race, which is completely original and the AI is pretty bad at it. You jump on the height of Wave Ramps to get a speed boost to race to the end. It's alright, but at least I don't have to bow down to your AI overlords this time. Like I said before, there's also a boss rush if you go out of your way to get 100%. And it really highlights how underwhelming most bosses are in this game. You load up Hammer or most of them die without much resistance. There are a few cool ones though. I really like Mega Titan. Instead of damaging him, you have to throw him into the electric wall. You can easily combo this dude into oblivion or have no ability and have a miserable time. There's not much in between. The second phase with the mini titan felt like a little too much though, even if it doesn't have much health. Gobbler being fought underwater is pretty cool, they don't do that often. But damaging him is really awkward most of the time time because he's underwater and you have to deal with swimming, which is probably why they don't do this very often. And you know how that we had Master Hand as a mini-boss? Well, what if you made Master Hand and Crazy Hand a full-on boss? Just to be even cooler. Use the Smash ability for the full, authentic experience. You know, now that I'm thinking about mini-bosses, some of them are oddly hard. Like, I have no idea why the fighter dog has so much reach for his grab thing, it's a pain in the ass. The throw elephant dude has the same thing going for it. And you know, why is throw even in this game? It's just something Kirby can do without an ability. In fact, I already complained about this. Look, Kirby and the Amazing Mirror is far from perfect, but this was a surprisingly fun time. 100% in the game gets tedious and annoying and dumb and I never want to do it again, but I had a blast just playing through the main game. A non-linear Kirby was a cool idea, and letting you go through the game whatever way you want is just insane. And it has four-player co-op on top of that. Very few games give you this much freedom, and it's weird seeing it from Kirby of all things. I've never expected a game like this to have so little hand-holding. Amazing Mirror is going to be pretty fun to replay, too. Like, Kirby's always had good replay value with the different copy abilities, but the 8 Mirror Shore is just another layer on top of that. Amazing Mirror does have its shortcomings with the lackluster new abilities and having pretty standard level design aside from being non-linear, but it's really easy to look past that. This is one of the most unique games in the series, and it was pretty refreshing finally going through it for me. It's not a game that's gonna blow your socks off or anything, but it's a fun romp. That's good enough for me.
Hopefully more people check this one out, because if the lack of in-depth reviews of it or anything go by, barely anyone talks about Amazing Mirror. Seriously, I can only find like two other reviews that are over 8 minutes. This game isn't even obscure, it's Kirby. Have you ever had a game from your childhood that you just cared less and less about over the years? Probably, but Kirby Squeak Squad is that game for me. It's not that I grew a sudden disdain for it or anything, I just never felt the need to play it again as time went on. Maybe it was because I was low-key obsessed with it at one point, I must have played it like 20 or 30 times back then. Whenever I was bored, Squeak Squad was just that game that I felt like going for another round with. So it's surreal to me that my once favorite Kirby game slowly became the one everyone likes to rag on. I don't think Squeak Squad is generally perceived as bad, just noticeably not as good as the other games. Especially compared to what came after. While I still need a play return in Dreamland, how is a remaster coming out just some playing through these games? Triple Deluxe and Robobot are my favorites now, so yeah. Squeak Squad was somehow sandwiched between a unique take on Kirby with Amazing Mirror and the best hot streak the series has ever had. It's pretty easy to forget about a standard game like Squeak Squad in hindsight, but given how it was my favorite game in the series until Triple Deluxe, I'm really curious as to what I'll think of it now. I haven't touched the game in years, so I was actually really looking forward to replaying this one, along with getting all three save files at 100%. Yes, that is a sentence I just said. This is a thing that I actually did. Well, let's start off with the story. It's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And so one day, Kirby's just sitting there trying to eat some cake when all of a sudden, it's stolen. So he goes on a trek to kick King Dedede's ass to get it back, but it was actually stolen by the Squeaks, a band of thieves that are all mice. So Kirby chases them down and endlessly kicks their asses into submission until he finds their hideout and kicks their leader's ass. Just so puffy hero is about to achieve his goal, none other than Meta Knight swoops in out of nowhere and steals the cake before Kirby can properly enjoy it. So then Kirby defeats Meta Knight in sword to sword combat. Probably. Like, you don't actually have to this time, but like, you can. And is about to claim his prize when the squeaks swoop back in and do what they do best and steal the cake. All seem lost for our pink friend until, upon further inspection, the chest containing the cake did not contain cake, and instead, held a demon that then possessed a roach and he flew away into space. So Kirby kicks the roach's ass again, but slightly stronger this time, then kicks the ass of a star with a giant eyeball. Wait, does it even have an ass? While pondering this question, Kirby finally gets his cake and everything goes back to normal. Yeah, that's it. Uh, that's the plot. I made none of that up. Not even the part where the chest had a demon inside of it. That is exactly what happens, and it's amazing for all the wrong reasons. Kirby doesn't usually have much of a story, but Squeak Squad is infamous for caring even less than usual. When someone tells you that the average story in a Kirby game is him going on a homicidal rampage to get a slice of cake, Squeak Squad is the game they're referring to. At least it has these cool cutscenes on occasion. I always like the more comic book style of them. They really could have done without the text, though. There's too much of it, they stay on screen for too long, and they tell you nothing. You could remove all of it and still understand what's happening. Aside from maybe the getting possessed by a demon part. But you can skip them, so it's not too big of a deal. The gameplay this time is about what you'd expect from Kirby by now. Squeak Squad's essentially just taking the foundation from Nightmare in Dreamland and Amazing Mirror and just adding on top of it some more. Most abilities even have multiple attacks now, albeit not to the extent of Superstar. So yeah, the gameplay is pretty similar to Amazing Mirror again, but with a linear structure this time and an actual health bar, and even using a lot of the same assets. Granted, this isn't bad on paper. Asset reuse is really common in video games, especially in a case like this. Amazing Mirror still looks good, even as a DS game. If it ain't broke, why fix it? But it's also a bit of a detriment in Squeak Squad's case. Yeah, it still looks good, but it also looks exactly the same as the last two games, and it also has the same music and basically all the same abilities. I mean, why else would Throw still be here? I should clarify that there are new abilities in music, but compared to the other games, Squeak Squad feels super samey. All the reused sprites and music rob the game of any kind of identity. Now, the new sprites and music are good, don't get me wrong, but it's hard to appreciate any of it because of how much is clearly reused from the GBA games. And I should reiterate that asset reuse is fine. It can even be a positive if done right, like Majora's Mask. But Squeak Squad went a bit overboard. You run around in environments that look similar to last time, and are usually listening to the same music as before. If you play Nightmare Dreamland and Amazing Mirrors, Squeak Squad's presentation is really underwhelming. It's pretty easy to forget this is a DS game. The bottom screen is barely used at all. But I won't complain about that because it makes it easier to record. That's such a weird thing with DS games. If both screens aren't properly used, it's technically a complaint, but I don't really care either way. What else is weird is that despite how underwhelming Squeak Squad is as a game, its structure is immaculate. And no, I'm not joking. 
You go from linear stage to linear stage, and each one has up to three chests that you can find. Collect every chest, and congratulations, you just 100% of the game. Sound familiar? Because it's what every main Kirby game does from now on. That structure that everyone's used to actually started in Squeak Squad. The controls and abilities feel a lot more like Superstar, too. Everyone usually points to Return to Dreamland for gaming the series of Modern Makeover, but no, it actually started here in Squeak Squad. It laid the groundwork for Modern Kirby, and it doesn't get any credit for it. Granted, it's the bare minimum of that kind of game here, but it was a massive step in the right direction. There's no gimmicks, Kirby's not nerfed for some reason, and even plays closer to Superstar. Superstar. Back then, this was as close to a straight Kirby game as you could get, which was really needed. Kirby used to have a bad habit of reinventing itself constantly and not building on top of what was already there. It didn't know what it wanted to be, it didn't want to have animal buddies, it didn't want to have a bunch of smaller games put together into one game, or didn't want to be non-linear all of a sudden. It made for good variety, but the quality varied. They were all good games, but you can tell that a lot more effort was put into Superstar. They figured out a great core gameplay style, and then pretended that it didn't exist. Exist. I feel they're on the right track structure-wise, the crystal shards, but how cryptic they were to collect and that you needed to collect all of them from the true ending just leaves a bad taste in your mouth. Squeak Squad feels like the middle ground between all of Kirby's ideas up to this point. While still not as deep as Superstar, the general gameplay is the closest it's ever been to it, with most abilities having multiple attacks, and the chests are mostly optional while straightforward to find. The only exception are these glowing chests that are almost impossible to miss. I really don't know why they made them required, I don't think I've ever missed any of them. Looking back on this, I can see why I like Squeak Squad so much as a kid. It finally found a good gameplay style for the series that works. Kirby was finally learning from his past instead of starting from scratch with every new game. It may have taken like 8 main entries to finally figure that out, but better late than never. Which is kind of a shame, because if Squeak Squad had more interesting level design, it really could have been something more fondly remembered. This game has some of the most bland levels in the series, I don't know how to describe it. There aren't any levels that stick out as bad, but there aren't any that stick out as particularly good. Like if you play a good stage, you just be like, whoa, that was sick at the end of it. Nothing even remotely close to that happened happens in this game. At best, it's like, okay, I enjoyed that. And the only way to really describe the average Squeak Squad level is you walk down a linear path and do things you normally do in a Kirby game. That's not very descriptive, that's what this game is. If you've played Nightmare in Dreamland or Superstar, you've already seen almost everything in this game. There's nothing like it. I love the port where you fight Meta Knight and have to escape from a sinking skyship, or having to kill Metroids was really cool. The most interesting the game ever gets level design-wise is you have to beat a squeak in a race toward a big chest. This is a very common occurrence. The game also has this annoying reliance on pick a path levels, like, oh ho ho, which way could the chest possibly be? You pick the left door instead of the right? Well, guess you gotta restart the level now. The levels are short enough to where it's not annoying, but come on, this is just unnecessary. I feel like I'm really grasping for straws when describing the levels in this game, but that's the thing. There's nothing particularly wrong with level design, but there isn't anything particularly noteworthy either. There isn't anything like, dude, there's a level where you paid a giant Moai head. At most, there's a few levels where you optionally dig through some dirt with a new animal ability to get a chest. Or, or to the port where you have to use wheel down a linear corridor to get a chest. Riveting. It's mostly stuff like that. Squeak Swaz level design just feels really phoned in. It doesn't help that the bosses are complete jokes. They have so little health that they die before they really have a chance to put up a foot. Especially with Tornado. I don't know what it is about Tornado in this game. It does a ton of damage and you're completely invincible while it's active. You don't have to play the game. You really don't. The easy bosses are especially noticeable whenever you go up against one of the squeaks. There's three of them that try and take the big chest before you, which is a cool idea on paper, but 95% of the time you just run away and completely ignore all the enemies. There's no threat, challenge, tension, anything. Even when you do finally have to fight one of these guys, they get knocked back after already hit you due to them, so it's really easy to just stun lock them so hard it gives Spork Mandrill nightmares. When Wispy Woods puts up a better fight than you, that's just sad. And he's not even in this game, which just feels illegal. The only major boss that's kind of hard is Krako, but that's only because there's a bottomless pit below you. Even the weirdo Demon Star barely puts up a foot. They even give you a maximum tomato bubble right before it, but you really don't need it. Normally I wouldn't really care about the difficulty because it's Kirby, but I beat the boss rush without even trying, that's just wow. You only get one tomato, but that's all you need. Just use tornado and you're golden. If you don't really have to play the game. You know, I haven't actually talked about the new abilities this time. They're fine. Magicians like magic from Amazing Mirror. 
but an actual ability instead of a randomized whatever the hell it was. You basically do magic tricks to do damage. It's a cool idea, but it's hard to aim, not very practical, and it's rare, so it kinda sucks. I actually really like Animal. You can do this slash that does decent damage, or do this drill attack that you can unlock later, but its main use is these dirt sections that you can dig through. Mostly just to get a chest, but hey, it's cool. I just wish it got more use. If it had more moves, Animal would be a really fun ability. The drill move in particular just feels really good to use. It's just that if there's no dirt, I don't have much reason to use it over something like Sword or Cutter that have more versatility and more range. The other new ability is Bubble, which gives you a bubble wand to turn enemies into bubbles. Squeak Squad has this inventory system where you can have up to five bubbles on the bottom screen and use them by touching them. They are usually abilities, but you can also get food items, and by combining abilities it rolls a random one like if you swallow two enemies at once. If you combine two food items, you get a better food item. There's also these small Kirby's that you can grab, and if you collect three of them, you get an extra life. Cool, I guess, but needing to use up one of your slots for this is pointless, so you have more than enough lives just playing the game normally. Because the issue with this system are the collectibles. For some godforsaken reason, each chest takes up an inventory slot. So despite having five slots, it's really only two. Like, it's really dumb, yeah, but honestly, it's not that big of a deal. If anything, you can always have one or two decent abilities in reserve, so that's nice. Inventory management can get annoying, though. You have to move a bubble to the top of the touchscreen and spit it out to get rid of it. So we have to awkwardly do this whenever you find a chest, which just gets worse when you're trying to steal a big one. It's not as bad on an actual DS, but it's still awkward. Ironically, this is the main reason why I don't like the bubble ability. You get a bunch of abilities to stock up on, but it's harder to take advantage of it when you have to throw so much of it away. As for what's actually in these chests, most of them are, again, fine, I guess. Puzzle pieces for some nice artwork, music for the sound test, and these things called ability scrolls. Abilities in this game can actually be upgraded, and you get a new move from them. It's cool on paper, but it loses its luster with how uninteresting it is most of the time. Like how Fighter gets a bigger aura sphere, or Fire and Ice can now aim up or down. Like, what's the point of this? Not to mention how some abilities just have straight upgrades instead, like Cut and Beam. They get bigger hitboxes and do more damage. I'm not gonna complain about this, but I really don't see the point. Probably the worst one is Animal, just because all it can really do is this annoying gravel move, which is a basic slash beforehand. I question why Animal just didn't have this drill move from the start. Its usability is really nerfed without it. Sword and Bomb are by far the weirdest scrolls. Because instead of a new move, they gain the ability to choose with Fire, Ice, or Spark if you combine them on the touchscreen. Except Fire Bomb, they're not cool enough. So you not only need two specific ability bubbles to use this in the first place, but you also need to decipher what the move description even means. I didn't get the hint for what this meant as a kid, and I didn't know you can combine bubbles in the first place. So I had no reason to believe that you could do this. And when I accidentally figured it out, there wasn't much reason to use it anyway. It's cool that this is in the game, it's just kind of like, why? Why go out of my way for this when they do reliable enough damage on their own? I think the elemental sword and bombs do a little more damage, but come on. Just use Tornado instead. The only time you can really access this is with your ability room anyway. It's more of a neat extra than anything else. But even more of a neat extra is an unlockable ability, Ghost. You'll get pieces of this ghost metal throughout the game. When you get all of them, certain mini bosses get replaced with a ghost mini boss, letting you get the ability to possess enemies. On the one hand, this ability is totally useless, but it's actually really cool how much effort they went through to let you possess most regular enemies. I just question why you have to go so out of your way to unlock it. Like, the earliest you can get this is the second to last level in the game. I get unlocking the ability room that late, but this? Why? It's just something you'll mess around with for five minutes and get bored. You know, between this, Boo, Mario, and Ghost Zelda, I don't know what it was with Nintendo and turning the most iconic characters into ghosts around this time. It was cool, I'd be down to kill off more of them. The only thing left to really talk about are the random ass extras. There's the pathetically easy boss rush that I mentioned before, and the extra mode that's just a speedrun mode. It's neat, but definitely not for me. I don't think you even get anything for finishing it. The sub games aren't half bad, though. Speedy tea time is quick draw, but with cake. You tap the cake to score points while the bombs stun you for the next round. It's kind of fun, but easy. Especially when the AI outright refuses to play the game. Like, look at this. This was the highest difficulty. <laughs> smash Ride lets you slide on the touchscreen to ride around and smash enemies off the stage. Bad phrasing aside, it's fine. Not much to say as usual. But I have even less to say about Treasure Shot because it's not only fine, once again, but playing it with a mouse is basically impossible. You have to swipe to aim at food, and if you hit him enough, you get points. I really can't play this one on an emulator, not that it matters. I doubt I'd care about it even if I did play it properly. Speaking of emulators though, I usually use Melon DS nowadays because it tends to work better for me and has much nicer upscaling. But after about 10 minutes, Squeak Squad looked like this. 
so I used his movement instead. I was shocked to find out that it recently had its first update in seven years. That's really weird. I guess you don't need an outdated fork to upscale games anymore, but Melon DS still performs a lot better. Again, none of this matters for the game itself. It's just a weird experience I had to try and record it. Anyway, Kirby Squeak Squad was a very whelming game. I actually try to describe it as the most bizarre thing. While playing, there isn't a lot that I actively dislike, but there isn't much to really talk about either. It's not good enough to gush about, it's not bad enough to make fun of, it's not weird enough to be charming. This is like the most room temperature neutral game I've ever played, which feels so weird to me because I loved it as a kid. But there isn't much reason to really come back to Squeak Squad nowadays. If you want a Kirby game like Squeak Squad, then Return to Dreamland, Triple Deluxe, and Planet Robobot are miles better. I don't want to be that guy that makes a video about revisiting a game in their childhood and ends up not being as good as they remember. This one is kind of overdone, and two, I actually enjoyed coming back to Squeak Squad, despite how indifferent I've sounded. It set up the groundwork for much better games, which I can appreciate, but on its own, it just kind of exists. Not bad, not great, just there. If you held me at gunpoint and forced me to play it, I wouldn't complain, but I'd rather just play something else, you know? And it's a shame, because if the game had some more interesting level design, it would have been a cool game to look back on. Squeak Squad is essentially the first modern Kirby game. It laid out the foundation for a much better adventure, but it just couldn't do anything with it. I'm gonna be honest, I've barely played any Kirby spinoffs. I'm not saying any of them are bad, I just never felt the need to play them. I've never been into golf and don't have any friends, so no Dream Course. I never liked match puzzle games, so no Avalanche. Pinball sounds neat, but I've got Pokemon Pinball for that. Canvas Curse and Rainbow Curse seem fine, but they never really interested me. The only two spinoffs that I'm actually interested in are Air Ride and Mass Attack, and even those ones I never felt like going yo-ho-ho -ho on. So that leaves us with Kirby's Epic Yarn, the one Kirby spinoff that I actually have played, which was on a rental once when it first came out. It's not that I didn't enjoy the game or anything, I remember liking it quite a bit. I just never got around to playing it again. And honestly, I think the reason why Epic Yarn is the only Kirby spinoff I've played is because it doesn't feel like a spinoff. This is still a 2D platformer, even if the game is fairly far removed from what you normally expect from Kirby. It's definitely one of those spin-off but not a spin-off kind of games. It wasn't made by HAL either, it was made by Goodfeel, who would later go on to make Yoshi's Woolly and Crafted World. God, if that isn't the most fitting developer name possible, especially with that pun title. How can yarn be epic? Well, yarn also means to weave a long and implausible story. We could have called this game Kirby's Long Poetic Ramblings, but it doesn't roll off the tongue quite as well. Ironically, the game's only like seven hours. Still a bit short, but longer than most of the games in the series. Anyway, Kirby takes up knitting. Was it a good idea? Feel free to listen to me garble into a microphone about it. Story-wise, Epic Yarn is definitely a weird one. There's this dude going around turning everything into yarn, including Kirby. Kirby gets sucked into Patchland and helps out this dude named Prince Fluff to gather up the magic yarn to stitch Patchland back together. That is basically it. Yin Yarn also ends up turning all of Dreamland into yarn, so Kirby has to go beat him up to get everything back to normal, so that's cool. But exactly what you expected. Although it's kind of funny how Yin Yarn defeated Dedede by having Yarn Waddle Dee's infiltrate his castle and he just didn't notice. It appeared that Yin Yarn's Waddle Dee imposters had captured all of the real Waddle Dee's. The internet's ruined me. The game's cutscene is also narrated by a guy with the most ASMR voice possible. I want him to read me a bedtime story. This grass feels fun. Funny, Kirby thought. It feels like pants. That voice really adds to how cozy this game feels. Like, you see in this? Everything in Epic Yarn looks like an arts and crafts project. Not everything's yarn, but it's at least fabric or buns or something similar. It's all just so adorable. There's tree fruits made of beads, snowballs and clouds made of fluff, even the doors and chests are just stickers that you peel off. The most impressive part is how parsable everything is. I was never confused about what was a platform or what wasn't. I could even tell that this single strand of yarn representing water was something that I could swim into. It's not just adorable, it's it's functional, and if your eyes weren't relaxed, your ears are definitely gonna be. The game's music is mostly this relaxing piano that honestly doesn't sound out of place in Minecraft. There are more upbeat tracks, but it all comes off as cozy and friendly. Kirby's Epic Yarn feels scientifically engineered to be a depression-free zone. From the aesthetics to the music to the enemies, no matter what you're into, there's bound to be something that just tugs at your heartstrings. I don't know what it is with me in winter levels, I just love the winter wonderland aesthetic. It may just be growing up in a cold climate and being like the one 
person here who actually likes the cold as long as it's not like 20 degrees Fahrenheit or something. There was just something about going through this cozy cabin with snow falling in the foreground, listening to nice music and jumping on Christmas trees that made my cold dead heart feel something. This is what Ohio does to a man. I'm sorry, but if this kind of level doesn't make you feel warm and fuzzy inside, you are a broken person. Please seek professional help. I am legitimately worried about you. I haven't talked about the actual game yet, huh? Epic Yarn isn't like other Kirby games. Because Kirby's now an outline of yarn, he can't suck up enemies, so no copy abilities. And because he can't use the suck, he can't fly either. Instead, he has this yarn whip to interact with the environment. He can use it to swing from buttons, unzip zippers, peel off stickers to open doors and chests, pick up enemies and throw them, stuff like that. Dashing turns you into a car, holding down the jump button turns you into a parachute to slow your descent, and he's also got a ground pound by pressing down all in the air. And that's basically your whole moveset. When all you have is a sideways Wii Remote to work with, that's all you can really do. You have, like, two buttons. Speaking of that, I forgot how uncomfortable this control method is. This thing is not meant to be a standalone controller. It works, doesn't make me cramp up or anything, but I would much rather use just about anything else. The main thing is that the D-pad is too small and causes me to have miss inputs every now and then. It would just be a lot more comfortable if it was a little bigger, you know? It makes a few Wii games really awkward to come back to, mainly this and Super Paper Mario. But despite the controller that I have to play it with, Epic Yarn actually controls well. Like, really well. Kirby was never really known for the platform. Platforming, but the jump physics in this game are really satisfying and feel just right. The sound effects really add to how good the game feels. Every time we tear away something or grab an enemy and curl them into a ball, ugh, that never gets old. And I really like how when you latch on to something with a whip, he's still staying in the air for a bit. It really sets off the good chemicals in my brain. There's even this one optional puzzle where you have to do this to get some extra height and low gravity. I felt like a god when I already knew what to do for that. Focusing more on the platforming feel was a really good move for this game. It's nice to have a Kirby game as fun as a platformer. I think it really reminds me of Kirby 64 in that regard. The generally good level design helps, as ideas feel a lot more like Mario. What I mean by that is that it has cool ideas, but it doesn't repeat them much so they don't get stale. Like how there's one level with dinosaur themed, and you're using dinosaurs as platforms and that kind of thing. But there isn't any other level like that. Hell, the whole world is called Hotland, but it doesn't stick to one kind of biome. First there's a desert level, then there's a volcano, then he finds shelter in a cool cave, then it's dinosaurs. Nothing ever overstays his welcome, which keeps the gameplay fresh. There's only a single level in Iceland where Kirby's dash turns into a sled instead of a car. You know they had restraint. Look at how happy he is. Sorry, it's actually called Snowland. That was a really missed opportunity. Probably the biggest thing about the levels in this game is that you can't die. Yep, Kirby is an immortal god that can't be hurt by anything. This is now canon. Instead of taking damage when you get hit, you'll lose beads, the main collectible. All they really do is increase your rank at the end of the stage. If you collect the end goal segments throughout the stage and land on a bonus panel, you get some extra beads at the end. It's not random at least, it lands on about where you hit the bell. This thing can really save your ass if you're going for gold ranks. Playing the game normally, there is zero challenge here. Literally, on a scale from 1 to 10 in terms of difficulty, Kirby's Epic Yarn is a zero. The only damage penalty is having beads fly out of you like Sonic losing rings. And if you fall in a pit, you just lose a bunch of beads. So if you don't care about rankings, just play it and have some fun, doesn't matter. But if you do go for gold ranks, there is a fair bit of challenge here. The later stages can be oddly punishing. Like I'm talking one fall into the pit from these annoying snowballs can drop you from gold all the way down to bronze. This game doesn't pull punches in that department. You have to play well if you want to get a good rank. It reminds me of Bayonetta of all things which is not something I thought I would compare this game to. So when you can't die, how do you make bosses interesting? Well, on their own, they're oddly satisfying to take down. You hit him to expose a weak point, then you slam him against the wall. Again, this never gets old. You really feel the impact of the hit. But the actual challenge comes from not getting hit yourself. You can usually hit bosses by throwing one of their attacks back at them, giving you more beads. And if you go beyond a gold rank on the boss, you get two bonus levels to go through. Like I said before, you can skip this if you don't care, but it does give a good incentive to actually fight the boss and learn the patterns instead of just standing there. The boss themselves aren't too noteworthy, but they are enjoyable. The only annoying one was Squashini, mainly because he will use this slot machine to determine what attack he'll use. It just feels a little too luck-based to get something that results in you being able to damage him. The fight against the Yarn was pretty cool. This dude summons enemies and even weaker versions of bosses using his weird-ass sock magic. It's a really cool idea given his abilities, but I really wish he didn't drop a massive explosion of beads when he beat him. It's almost impossible to not unlock the bonus levels, it just takes the fun out of it. 
Oh, uh, I gotta mention this real quick. I love how each level doesn't just appear. Each one has a unique animation with the door becoming accessible. It's a great touch and super charming. One of the things I like about Kirby is how it blatantly ignores game design conventions. Like, obviously you wouldn't want to give the player infinite jumps on a platformer because it makes it too easy. But in Kirby, if you think something's too hard or you just flat out don't want to play it, you can literally just fly over it. The lack of death actually feels like an extension of that philosophy. You have an incentive to get better ranks if you want more of a challenge, but if you don't care about that, then you can just ignore it and have a good time going through these delightful levels. Despite not playing like a Kirby game, Epic Yarn still feels like Kirby, which is cool. These people made a game where you can't die interesting. You have no idea how impressive that is. The only issue with this is that sometimes there's a puzzle that you can't reset unless you restart the whole level. Because when you normally play a video game and want to reset the puzzle in the room, you have two options. Either you leave the room and come back, or you kill yourself. That's just how video games work. But in Epic Yarn, you obviously can't die, and because every level is one continuous string of level, you can't leave the room and reset it. So if you mess up certain puzzles, you have to restart the whole level. Now these kinds of things are just to get optional collectibles, you can't softlock yourself or anything, but it's still annoying if you're trying to get all of them. It's just an ironic side effect from making the game easier. And so, what do these collectibles do? Why, you can use them to decorate your apartment, of course. To be clear, I don't have anything against this. It's a neat little feature they put a surprising amount of effort into. I'm just weirded out by how random it is. Like, hey, you know what this jumpy game needs more of? Interior decorating. What? This is also the only thing you can spend your beads on, other than buying more floors for the apartment building. Yeah, you have to furnish the apartments of your neighbors. What a ripoff. Least evil landlord. I also have an uncanny talent for getting every furniture piece except the ones I actually need. So now there's some dumb mini games that I can't play. Not that I care, it just bothers me on an emotional level, you know? This upset Kirby. The only other thing I haven't talked about are the transformations. While Kirby doesn't have copy abilities, he can at least transform into vehicles and stuff near the end of levels sometimes. Most of them are pretty fun. There's a tank that shoots missiles, a dune buggy racing thing, a penguin on a surfboard, a fire truck for some reason. There's even this digging thing that's basically just an animal from Squeak Squad, but better. And it's really fun, who would've thought? The only annoying one is the train. You point it at the screen and draw tracks and it rides along it. Basically a worse canvas curse, presumably. Again, I haven't played them. The train just isn't fun. I found myself groaning whenever it showed up, and I think I hated it as a kid too, so you know it's not fun. The transformations usually are though, they're mainly just a neat way to spice up the gameplay a bit. I especially like the shoot 'em up sections with this rocket. Alright, does Kirby's Epic Yarn look like a fun, relaxing game to you? Are you interested in playing it but don't own a Wii? Well, you're in luck, because there's also a 3DS version for some reason. I'm baffled by the fact that Extra Epic Yarn exists, not because it materialized into your own plane of reality one day, but because it came out in 2019. 2015? Okay, yeah, sure, that'd be cool. But 2019? When Switch was well into its life and everyone had already moved on from 3DS and Wii U? It's cool they were able to get this working on 3DS, but do you know how much better this would have been on Switch? They seriously could have made this game look really good, and it already looked really good, but nah, 3DS. It also made some weird decisions to mess with the level design. Now, I should preface my complaints with the fact that I have not played Extra Epic Yarn, but for some reason they added copy abilities. In a game where it was refreshing that I didn't have copy abilities. And because it wasn't designed around abilities, they don't have much reason to be here and they don't add anything to the overall experience. There's also a hard mode where you can take damage and die, but they also put in this weird demon thing that follows you around. It doesn't really make the game harder, just annoying. I stuck with the Wii version on Wii U for this video, but I didn't have any reason to play it on 3DS. Also, despite playing the digital Wii U release of the game, my save file from when I first played it off of a rental is still there. That's crazy. With how much I had to clean up save files over the years to save space, I don't know how it survived. Ultimately, Kirby's Epic Yarn isn't a deep game. I'm pretty sure I skipped over a lot about this one. Not every game needs some 8 hour long grand essay with a doctoral thesis-esque conclusion. This is a game made for babies, but luckily, I am a baby, and I eat this up like candy. Despite being so different from a regular Kirby game, it's actually a lot closer to one than you would think. Epic Yarn is expertly crafted to activate every dopamine receptor there is. Needless to say, it's a fun time. I didn't feel the need to do everything this time, completing all the dumb minigames felt pointless. But if I ever have a particularly bad day, Epic Yarn's a great way to forget about the horrors of real life. Everyone has that one game you just never play despite always being interested in it. The game comes out, it's good, everyone loves it, you want to play it, but for one reason or another you just don't. 
the years go by and you just never get around to playing it despite always wanting to there is literally no reason why you never played it you just didn't. If you actually look at video titles before clicking on them, you know that game for me is Kirby's Return to Dreamland. Or Kirby's Adventure Wii for all you Europeans out there. Like, what? Not as bad as Yoshi's Topsy Turvy to Universal Gravitation, though. Anyway, I genuinely have no idea how I never played one of the most beloved games in the Kirby series. It is, without exaggeration, the only main series Kirby game I have never played before now. Seriously, when did this game come out? 2011? What other games could I have possibly been playing when I was 13? Portal 2, Ocarina of Time 3D, Pokemon Black and White, Super Mario 3D Land, Sonic Generation, Skyward Sword. Okay, that's probably why I didn't play it. 2011 was a pretty stacked year. I also got Metroid Fusion and Minish Cap on 3DS, so those two. But realistically, I was suffering from a clinical Little Big Planet 2 addiction. So now we know why I never played Kirby's Return to Dreamland. In 2011, why I never picked it up after is beyond my understanding. I finally bought it on Wii U when I bought Epic Yarn for the last review, but then the universe told me it was better to wait even longer, because they announced a remaster of the game back in September. It wasn't even leaked, they were just like, yo, play the game this time, or else. I was very confused, but I wasn't complaining. When I went to buy it, I even did it the old-fashioned way. I pulled up to Walmart, spent an embarrassingly long time trying to find an employee to open the game cabinet, and bought it in person. A COVID? ChatGBT? Elon Musk? What are you talking about? It's 2011. I just took an arrow to the knee. Praise the sun. I have waited far longer to play Return to Dreamland than any person reasonably should. Let's just get into it already. Unlike most Kirby games, Return to Dreamland actually has a plot. A dimensional vortex rips a hole in the sky and it spews out a ship piloted by an alien guy named Magalore. So Kirby and the gang collect all the parts to repair it. You remember how I said this game had a plot? I lied. Like, it's something. What, you don't want to help out the funky little alien dude? What kind of monster wouldn't want to help out the funky little alien dude? Let's just get to the gameplay quicker, at least. The actual structure of the game is basically the same as Squeak Squad. Play through a few stages, get the main collectibles along the way, and fight a boss in the end of each world. There's no unlockable extra stages, though. It's kind of a shame. I always like those. But the main difference between this and Squeak Squad is how much better the game is. And a big part of that is the abilities. There's 20 regular abilities in the base game, with two more in deluxe, and basically all of them are good. Return to Dreamland takes the original philosophy Superstar had with his abilities and embraces it. Almost every ability has multiple attacks, and they're all more fun to use because of it. They all do reliable damage as well, so just playing the game casually, you won't have to worry about making things harder for yourself without realizing it. Uh, Unless you use Parasol, but no one uses Parasol. <laughs> now that the games are ever hard, there is just always that one ability that's blatantly better than everything else. Usually Tornado or Hammer. That's not the case anymore. My only real complaint with the ability selection this time around is an auto mission or wheel. You can do this dash attack as Needle, which I think was supposed to replace it, but it's not really the same. I'm glad they brought back Wheel immediately after. On top of that, base Return to Dreamland has four new abilities, and both of Deluxe's new abilities are brand new. Putting in abilities from later games would make sense, but they didn't do that. These chads just made new ones entirely, that's awesome. But let's start off with the ones first introduced in the Wii version. Leaf is pretty good, its main thing is this tornado that has a pretty wide area of effect. It does alright damage. The Leaf uppercut is generally more reliable. This downward leaf throw is decent, but you mainly want to stick to the uppercut. The main thing that makes leaf so good is that if you guard, you hide in a pile of leaves and you're invincible. This makes leaf more of a defensive ability. While you can't do a ton of damage, comparatively speaking, you can at least avoid taking damage pretty easily. Water is a bit more interesting. I'm honestly surprised it took so long to get something like this. Running lets you run on lava, which is pretty cool. Water's sprint attack also has a really wide area of effect, making this pretty good for crowd control and just generally sprinting through levels. The standard attack has a lot of range, too. It's hard to hit airborne enemies with it, but since you can just stand back and spam the attack from a safe distance, it usually evens out. The only part that I don't like about water is that it has this power wash dare attack that's hard to use and doesn't even do that much damage. But otherwise, water's a pretty fun long range ability. It even makes your underwater bubble attack stronger, which is a pretty neat idea. Out of all the new abilities, the only one I don't really like is Spear. It has really good range and does reliable damage, but it can't really do much beyond this standard pointy stick attack and a stab flurry. There is a Spear spin thing, but it's so hard to aim that it's really not worth using. I know a lot of people like Spear, but I'd rather use Whip. It's basically just Spear, but better. It has a bit less range, but it can grab items from a distance, and its Whip Flurry has a surprisingly nice hitbox. Plus, it gives you an off-brand Indiana Jones hat. What's not to love? Ultimately, Whip is still pretty basic, but it's fun, so whatever. 
The two new abilities in Deluxe's are things to get really interesting, because aside from both of them being completely new, they're both kind of broken. Mecha basically replaces Laser while also having a dash spark fist and upwards fire cannons. The fire cannon in particular is actually pretty good against bosses, it has a really nice arc that's easy to abuse. You don't have to aim much with it. Alright, remember when I said there weren't any blatantly broken abilities in this game? Well, I lied. Again, in Deluxe, that ability is San. This thing does stupid amounts of damage no matter what you do. The regular San attack has a weirdly good range and his up attack shreds every and all bosses. I used San for the arena and won without even trying. This thing is bonkers. Okay, not Hammer Bonkers. But the thing that makes it stronger than Hammer, in my opinion, is that it has Leaf's Invincible Leaf Pile, but with Sand. Hammer does a ton of damage, but it has limited range, and you still need to be decent at avoiding enemy attacks. With Sand, you really don't have to play the game. I will say, though, both abilities are really well implemented in the game. If I didn't know they were new, I would have assumed they were in the original, aside from never needing to use them to collect energy stairs. But they make an already easy game even easier. That's probably only my real issue with Return to Dreamland. It's easy even my Kirby standards. I'd still say Squeak Squad and Star Allies are easier, at least it doesn't play itself, but it's still on the made for babies side. The collectibles aren't even hard to get. There's energy spheres in each level. Wait, why are they called energy spheres when they look like gears? Whatever. Point is, most of them aren't hard to find. They're mostly either on the main path or insanely easy to figure out if you have half a brain cell. I at least kind of like how taking a mini boss's ability will usually let you get an energy sphere. It encourages you to try out all the different abilities. But there's this one sphere in 6 2 where instead of taking Spark from the mini boss, you instead need to take Whip from before the boss and bring that to this platform to hit the last bomb block to reveal the energy sphere. Spark and Plasma are on the same ability now, so I assume I can use a Plasma Sphere thing to break it, but the roof prevents you from going that high, so what? <laughs> That's so dumb. And if you mess it up, there's no way to retry, so I had to replay almost the whole level. This is like the one energy sphere in the whole game that's annoying. It's a bizarre design oversight. The whole game has taught you that a mini boss means you might need this for the next energy sphere, but this one's like, nah, you need whip, actually. Dude. At least this is what I thought until I found out that I am an idiot. There's a new move for Spark that's useful in this exact situation. I really just spent half a paragraph complaining that I lack basic reading comprehension. Can you tell that I don't use Spark very often? I should also mention that one of my favorite energy spheres is right before this, like literally in the room before the mini boss. You have to take stone through this underwater passageway without getting hit by the spiky cylinders. It's a nice challenge and a cool use of an ability. The only other energy sphere that's kind of annoying is this one in the cannons, just because the timing is a bit finicky. At least you can easily kill yourself if you mess it up, so it's not that bad. Like, I don't know why this game even has lives. Now, I know I didn't mention the good energy spheres much, but most of them are fun to collect. I just wish they weren't so obvious. It would have made things a bit more enjoyable for me. While they're all optional, getting them all is so easy that you might as well just go for 100%. However, I will gladly take this over whatever cryptic garbage was going on in some of the previous games. I still have nightmares about Dreamline 3 sometimes. The actual level design is fun at least, which is weird because it's not too different from Squeak Squad fundamentally, but it's much more interesting. I think it's mainly because a lot of levels have a theme in them. Like there's one level that's all about water currents, there was another with clever use of cannons, even the earlier levels of theme around being a good introduction for the rest of the game. That last one goes without saying in any decent video game, the actual theming to the levels go a long way in making the experience a lot more cohesive. It feels like what they were doing in Epic Yarn. It may have been a spin-off made by different devs, but they really did take a lot of good design cues from that game. Think Raisin Ruins. Like Epic Yarn, it's not just a straight desert the whole time. There's actual progression in between stages. The first level's a desert, the next is an oasis, then ruins, then deep ruins. It's logical and satisfying to see that kind of progress through the area, and helps distract from its light case of new Super Mario Bros. syndrome. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. World 1. Grassy Plains. World 2. Deserts. World 3. Beach slash ocean. But instead of World 4 being a forest, we skip straight to ice. We skip the mountains and then go to clouds, and the final world is lava theme. The only world that really sticks out in this environment is Egg Engine. It's obviously not the first factory in a Kirby game, but it at least sticks out compared to everything else. Now, it does spin a lot of these ideas in new ways. It's not quite new SMB levels of generic, like how Dangerous Dinner has you avoiding suns and that kind of thing. It's the lava stage taken to the 
logical extreme. Like, what's hotter than lava? The giant ball of gas in the sky that keeps the planet from being an uninhabitable wasteland, obviously. That's just cool, man. Or how Nutty Noon isn't quite generic cloud place. It has more of a Jack and the Beanstalk vibe to it and transitions into a castle in the sky looking place. Also, what kind of a name is Nutty Noon? The joke almost writes itself. The only really generic one is White Wafers. It's mainly just random glacier looking place. It at least evolves into an ice palace, but that's about it. It probably wasn't the best idea to have a water level after having an entire world of water levels. At least that place has some weird mermaid palace looking stuff in the background. Along with having more theming, there's these power-ups to spice up the gameplay. They usually come in the form of grabbable items, usually just to get an energy sphere. But hey, occasionally having a magic rainbow parasol or a cannon that shoots in an arc forward or a giant boot is enough to keep things interesting. The keys even lead to some decent puzzles or platforming challenges, since you can't fly around holding something. But the main herb to go along with these spices are super abilities. At the end of levels every now and then, an alternate dimensional enemy pops out of one of those portals Magalor came through. Swallow that sucker and get an upgraded version of one of Kirby's abilities. There's five of them, and they're all basically the same. Ultra Sword is a screen nuke, Monster Flame is a screen nuke, Grand Hammer is an earthquake, Snowball is at least a giant snowball, and Flare Beam is a giant energy orb that you can move around the screen. That's all they really do, aside from breaking things marked with a star on them. It's pretty brainless overall, you just hit the attack button when you see enemies. At best, you do it with the right timing, with little consequence if you screw it up. I'll give Flare Bean credit though, while it's still haha <laughs> energy ball of death go burr, you're at least doing something. Everything else is just a different flavor of kill everything, aside from like one puzzle with a grand hammer. I don't know, I guess it's more about the spectacle, because it's pretty insane to have this much power and tear through everything in your path. Even one-shotting mini-bosses like regular enemies near the end. It does that really well, it's a huge power trip. But when there's like two or three of these per world, it gets boring. Almost all of them follow the same formula. Break stuff until you find the portal, play through a harder section with no ability while a rubber banding death wall chases you, then fight a sphere doomer to get two energy spheres. Those alternate dimension sections can be kind of interesting because they make good to use your suck skills, but they're honestly not that much harder than the regular game. The different kinds of sphere doomer do have different attacks, and you have a limited ability selection to fight them with, but these fights get pretty boring. They're not different enough to be interesting, it's mainly just the same mini-boss over and over. I wouldn't say I got tired of fighting them, but they quickly became something I only did out of obligation. Speaking of that, pretty much all of the bosses are boring. They do not have enough health and go down super fast. I played through the standard arena twice, once with sand and once as Deity. I won both times and didn't have much issue. Even when you have to dodge attacks and getting close like you do with Hammer, it's really not that hard to get the patterns down. The hardest boss is probably Goriath because of his sporadic movement that makes him hard to hit, especially when he goes super sand for some reason. But the answer to this is, you guessed it, sand. When you 100% the main game, you unlock extra mode, which is the same game again, with half health. There's a few stronger enemies and sometimes more annoying obstacle placements, but it really just is the same game again. The bosses are harder too, and come in their shiny form to signify they're more dangerous. Credit where credit is due, these bosses do put up a fight for the most part. Wispy Woods is still Wispy Woods though. The EX bosses really aren't that bad, but they might take a few tries this time, that's all. Except Mr. Duder, I will never make fun of his name ever again. The Metal General also has a second and third phase to his fight now for some reason. I think this is new and deluxe, so why this boss specifically? That's so weird. And honestly, it's kind of hard to appreciate the extra effort because I was so done with this game at this point. Extra mode was totally unnecessary. This isn't like Nightmare in Dreamland where it's only like three hours long. This is an eight hour game. Playing it again, but with some minor changes to make it slightly harder is just draining. I get that you can already play the whole game as DDD and Meta Knight and Co-op, but having an abridged version of the main game instead of just the game but again, would have made extra mode a lot easier to stomach. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention they finally brought co-op back. The game's actually a lot better design around it than you'd expect. Super Mario Bros. Wii got pretty chaotic in co-op, but you luckily can't throw your friends and loved ones into lava in Kirby. I was that kid. Mistakes were made. I was 11. The other players actually don't get in your way very much, which is pretty nice. They help you out more than anything. Like, if you thought the bosses were easy before, just watch them melt now. I almost feel bad for them. You can completely ignore a few puzzles, too, which is just funny. You do share lives, but you have so many of them that it really doesn't matter unless you're all particularly awful this game made for children. To make things a little more interesting, players 2 through 4 can either play as a colored Kirby or one of his stupid friends. Meta Knight is basically how he worked in Superstar Ultra, kind of a mix between Sword and Wing. 
DDD is basically Hammer, and Bandana Waddle Dee is basically Spear. Yeah, this is the first game Bandana Dee really had any relevance in, aside from DDD's Revenge from Super Soul Ultra, I still feel bad about beating him senseless. Many people believe this Waddle Dee with a bandana and a pointy stick to be peak Kirby character, but honestly, I don't see it, this dude's kinda lame. <laughs> it probably doesn't help that I don't like Spear. I know I just insulted someone's religion, but hey, that's what happens when I talk politics. This is a Wii game. <laughs> And because the game was on Wii, you just hooked up another Wii mode and you're good to go. No link cables, no setting up local play. It was simple. Maybe a little too simple though, because it's still local only on Switch, which is a massive bummer. I know I made a joke about pretending that it's 2011, but it's not 2011, it's 2023. The game didn't have online co-op originally, and it's probably out of scope for a remaster like this. But you did it for Mario 3D World, why not for Return to Dreamland? Not everyone's capable of meeting up in person. The only way me and my friends could even play together was through some janky parsec setup of one of us emulated on Yuzu, which actually worked shockingly well at least until Zack's ISP started throttling Parsec after like an hour of play, and he's the only one out of us with fast enough internet to make the game actually playable. It was a huge pain. A pain that could have been prevented if they just added an online mode to this $60 game. Why is this not a thing? Why are we even paying for Switch Online? At least the sub-games have multiplayer too. Actually, why is this a positive? Does anyone care? Anyway, Return to Dreamland Deluxe has a lot of sub-games, 10 to be exact, which is a huge step up from the originals 2, one of which was removed from Deluxe for some reason. You'd think that Scope Shot was removed because it used the Wii Remote Pointer, but on the draw it seems to use the same targeting as Scope Shot, but with an analog stick, so I don't know why they removed it. It's just a shooting gallery. Ninja Dojo has you throw shurikens at targets. That's basically it. Just press the A button with proper timing. Not bad, not great either. The other sub-games in Deluxe are mostly remakes of sub-games from previous games with multiplayer added, but there are two new original ones. The first is Magalore's Tome Trackers, where you run around and get the book that Professor Magalore wants. It's a fun idea on paper, but it ends up being too much for my brain to handle, especially on later difficulties where he tries to fake you out with having different colors of the same symbol and stuff like that. It just requires too much focus for my brain. Booming Blasters is more of an arena fighter thing. You all have a gun and you have to fight over ammo. There's also a Mega Death Ray that I think will instantly kill another player if it hits, but has a really long startup time. That's mainly it. It's probably the best sub game with friends, but it's only fun for like 10 minutes. The rest are remakes of previous sub games, so they're not worth talking about too much. Samurai Kirby is Quick Draw, which is still impossible. There's Egg Catcher, where Kirby eats eggs with the shell, which is still disgusting. Also, getting a perfect score on hard is basically impossible. Crackety Hack is still easy, Smash Ride is still boring, Kirby on the draw is still a generic shooting gallery, but still gives a god tier reaction image. And Bomb Rally is still pretty frantic, but I liked it better on GBA. The more zoomed in camera angles made it feel faster and more chaotic, in a way that I can't really describe. They also brought back Checkerboard Chase from Kirby 64. It's alright, you basically have to trap your opponent into falling into the holes you create. It's kinda unique, but also kinda boring. In the original, you unlock sub games from Energy Spheres, but on Switch, they're all unlocked from the start through Magaland, so I don't know why they're still on Magalore ship. Otherwise, these spheres unlock ability rooms and special copy ability challenges. These are kinda neat, they not only act as an advanced tutorial for certain abilities, but they also test you actually know how to use them well. They have ranks too, so there is a bit more replayability there if you care about that for some reason. Seeing as there's challenges, Challenges for Sand and Mecha, they actually added new ones in Deluxe. Extra mode even has different challenges than normal mode. I was shocked when I saw that. I assumed they were just gonna be the same challenges, but with harder rank requirements. There was actually a lot of effort here to make fun challenges that make good use of abilities. There were even a few extra challenges, including Kirby's dream collection of all things. Yeah, that collection on Wii that they made for the 20th anniversary, they just put in more Return to Dreamland challenges for some reason. They're not particularly noteworthy or anything, aside from a few stages where you race against Magalore, but it's way more effort than you'd expect from a collection like this. They also added two challenges for Smash, which was definitely not in Return to Dreamland. <laughs> it's like, dude, what? Aside from a few challenges, Deluxe actually has a few new miscellaneous things, like a gallery of past adventures, and then it just lists every game that came after Return to Dreamland, including games that you literally can't buy anymore. I really don't know why this is here. I know I was in Forgotten Land, but it makes no sense in Return to Dreamland, especially when they're just shilling newer games instead of having a different gallery for older games. That'd be neat. Would have at least been different from Forgotten Land's past adventures. The much cooler addition is all these collectible masks that you can get through the main 
minigames. It's mostly cosmetic, but it's nice that they actually found a way to incorporate the random collectibles from later games. I say mostly cosmetic because I noticed how the Kind Mask gives you water stronger underwater attacks, so I think some of them actually have small bonuses like that. I just didn't experiment much because I don't know why I would want to wear anything else. But the main new thing in Deluxe is the Magalore epilogue. And if you were watching trailers and wondering why Magalore is stuck in this weird alternate dimension, well, let's talk about how that happened because it is wild. Wait, 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 spoilers? In a Kirby game? How could there possibly be anything to spoil about this game? Oh, my sweet summer child. If you don't know, you should not be here. You should be playing the game. Oh, wait, I don't care. The whole game, you've been collecting parts to repair Magalore's ship, the lore. After you finally get this thing repaired, you travel back to Magalore's dimension and fight the dragon that's suddenly gone on a rampage for whatever reason. It's still angry and can't be approached from the air, so you gotta walk the last two worlds over to it. But Kirby and the gang make it over there and obviously beat up the weirdo four-headed dragon. And then, Magalore comes in and scoops up the master crown that the dragon was wearing. Oh, you fucking bitch. Yeah, me too, DDD. My brain would have exploded from this plot twist at 13. If you're wondering, oh, what's the big deal? Here's the thing, man. This is a Kirby game. I expect elder chores beyond moral comprehension for the final boss. I do not expect the funky little alien dude to go on a power trip and attempt to violently murder us all. Remember when everyone was coming up with conspiracy theories that Elflin and Forgotten Lambs are gonna betray everyone and commit several war crimes? We've been there before. This little shit is why Kirby fans have trust issues. It's such a great plot twist because you really just don't expect it. I really wish I didn't get spoiled on this. It was years ago. Who knows how I found out about it. It's impossible to avoid because of how unexpected it is. How can you not mention this to people? Like, hey, did you play the Kirby game the friend-shaped alien dude is actually a maniacal backstabbing bastard? And the best part? It's been foreshadowed the whole game. Want to know what the first letter of each world spells out? Crown. Return to Dreamland marks a new tradition of making insane final bosses. Because you not only have to defeat a four-headed dragon, but after realizing Magalore has been manipulating Kirby and friends, Landy helps you out and follow Magalore through a dimensional vortex. It's a space shooter section, sure, but it's kind of cool riding the boss that you thought was the final boss to destroy the ship you've spent the whole game repairing. The first phase of the Magalore fight is fairly standard, aside from this awesome-ass dimensional vortex backdrop. Seriously, this place just screams final boss, it's unreal. But the cool part is when he puts up his magic barrier around him, and you have to fight him using super abilities. You have to do this with a Grand Doomer too, this is a cool idea. And I won't lie, landing the big blow with the biggest ultra sword known to man feels insanely good. Like, yeah, fuck you, Magalore. Then for the final phase, Magalore gets completely overtaken by the Master Crown and turns into the Hellish Abomination of the Week. This is the best part of the fight, hands down. Because you just use super abilities, you don't have an ability going into this last part. You just have to roll with what the game gives you. It's a nice challenge, especially when he starts to use his own super abilities for attacks. Magalore is up there in terms of Kirby final bosses. It's an insane fight with like five phases in total that just keeps getting better as it goes on. Too bad that sand just completely melts every part of this fight. If I ever end up playing this game again, I'm gonna have to remember not to use sand, like, ever, because Jesus, this thing is way too strong. But after Kirby violently murders Magalore's ass, he ascends to a higher plane, or something. Which is where the new Magalore epilogue starts. So yeah, I couldn't really talk about this without spoiling the only plot twist in the series. Anyway, Magalore is rotting in hell. Probably. He's lost most of his power, so we have to collect these magic orbs that act as experience to upgrade your abilities. This is an original Kirby campaign where you don't play as Kirby, which is kind of cool. And while we start out as a weakling, it doesn't take long for Magalore to become insanely overpowered. I'm talking dash attacks with invincibility, bomb showers, two screen nukes, even if they require a full mounting meter, a shield that makes you invincible for five hits with no cooldown, and air dodge that lasts an insanely long time. Like, why did this dude think he needed the Master Crown? When fully upgraded, Magalore is practically invincible. Level design is pretty standard though, nothing you haven't seen out of the base game. But it is pretty neat to have a Kirby game designed around always having the same moveset. A lot of Magalore's abilities get used pretty often in a really good effect. You even have these challenge rooms to give you even more experience to upgrade even more stuff. It's actually pretty satisfying how strong you get so quickly. My only real issue is that some of these challenges didn't need to have an upgrade level gate. Like for the health challenge, it has to be at least level 3, but you could absolutely get through 
through this without it. It's not a huge deal, just annoying. That's all this really is. You go through some levels, make yourself stupidly strong, fight a few bosses, and it's over in two hours. Just a fun side mode to explain what happened to Maglor after the game ends. Because honestly, I don't really know what happened. You spend the whole campaign collecting these weird apple slices, and it ends up being absorbed by the Master Crown or something, so we have to fight Wispy Woods on Mega Steroids. Like, god man, what a backdrop this is. Some apocalyptic ruined city bullshit. Thanks, Magalore. Not too out of place, though. Kirby games go through this kind of thing on a weekly basis. It is a pretty fun boss, though. It was oddly challenging. I'd imagine that it's a total joke if you went out of your way to fully upgrade all of your abilities, but I'm not insane, so no thanks. Alright, get this. The epilogue doesn't lead into Trouble Deluxe. It leads into Team Kirby Clash Deluxe. Or Super Kirby Clash, because rep the 3DS eShop. Again. How have I mentioned this twice in one video? Yeah, this leads into the free-to-play game, and the grand evil that you have to fight is the microtransactions. I, I, I just, I, I can't with this series sometimes, man. Alright, look, I doubt I have anything else to say about Kirby's Return to Dreamland, and honestly, I wish I played this sooner. Not because it's all, wow, this game is incredible, how did I not play this years ago? It's more so... That's it, huh? This game has been oddly underwhelming for me. Maybe it's from wanting to play it for so long, but it just left me feeling empty. I first played Dreamland 3 and Amazing Mirror for those reviews, and those games did weird and unique things that made them fun to talk about. Return to Dreamland is in this weird limbo for me, where it's absolutely better than most Kirby games that came before it, but it's not nearly as good as the ones that came after it. It feels like a big improvement of the return of form that Squeak Squad was, but that's about it for me. I really feel like I would have liked this game a lot better if I played it when it first came out. Like, this would have blown my mind when I was 13, especially at the point where, if you know, you know. But here I am, almost 25, and just thinking, huh, that was neat. Playing through extra mode and some co-op probably didn't help. I played this game twice for this review, and I feel completely burnt out on it. I was already having a hard time figuring out what to say about this game, but playing it a second time just cemented that, despite this somehow ending up in almost 27 minutes. It's a good game. It's curvy. But at the end of the day, I don't feel joy from finally playing a game I've waited so long to play. I just feel... regret.